Yeah, so today's first student, first speaker is my student, PhD student Tian Yi Sun, who is currently in his fourth year in the program of statistics. And Tian Yi did his bachelor's degree in engineering from the Department of Automation in Tsinghua University. And then he came to University of UCLA to do his PhD in statistics. And since working with me, he has been working on the single cell RNA-seq computational method development. So today he's going to talk about a simulator we developed. It's called SC Design 2. Okay, so um, so starting. Okay, uh, thank you, Jessica. Okay, uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, Today I'm going to introduce a project that we recently wrapped up. It's called SA Design 2, uh, which is a high fidelity SA RNC simulator that can capture gene correlations. So first I'm going to introduce the motivation. Uh, so here uh, I have a figure that shows the development of single cell RNC protocols. Uh, so ever since the single cell RNC technology has been introduced, uh, it has gained a lot of attention. And the people have uh, done a lot of research on developing new protocols to improve the experiment. So then a natural question for researchers is that uh, how can we decide to choose which protocols to use? And then there's another question, uh, which is, um, from this figure, we can see that uh, as the new technologies are being developed, people are focusing on how to sequencing how to sequence more cells, but uh, that may not uh, translate to a better experimental result uh, because uh, in practice, um, we are usually under a fixed budget, uh, which means that we have a fixed a, a total amount of information that we can get. And if you sequence more cells, it, it will mean that you have the lo a low resolution picture for each cell. But if you sequence less cells, um, you have a high resolution for each cell, but uh, you might not get enough cells from, from your sample, uh, which means you might miss some uh, cell types. So here is a toy example of this breast versus depth trade-off under this fixed budget of 500K reads. And in this particular toy example, we can see that sequencing less cells can actually give us a better result. But how to choose this number systematically? That's another uh, question. Uh, so here is a brief summary. Um, I've talked about this first uh, category of problems is how to, uh, it's about the experimental design, how to, so first we want to decide how to choose among existing protocols. For example, uh, how to choose between full lens or tag based. And then we have the question of given a protocol, how to determine the optimal uh, experimental parameters, like the number of cells to sequence and sequencing depths. And another uh, related, related category of problems is that we want to uh, also uh, benchmark computational methods so uh, here I've listed many of the popular single cell analysis tasks. And for each task, uh, many methods have been developed and uh, different, different methods uh, may be suitable for different uh, types of data. Uh, maybe some, some are better suited for full lens protocols. Maybe others are better suited for type-based protocols. And uh, so, we also want to uh, do a systematic benchmarking of these available computational methods. So uh, we want to use a simulator to address these two issues because with simulators, we can generate um, large numbers of uh, simulated data sets very cheaply, very efficiently. And, and also we have for the benchmarking, we have the ground truth. Uh, for example, we have the ground truth labels of cell types so that can help with the benchmarking of computational methods. 
Uh, okay, so then here I have a figure that uh, shows a summary of the existing methods, uh, existing simulators, and uh, also our RC design tool. So we can see that many simulators have been proposed so far, um, but uh, none of them can satisfy uh, these six properties that we've listed here, uh, especially uh, for especially uh, none of the current simulators that, that is listed here can capture uh, gene correlations very well. Okay, so, <clears throat> so here I want to briefly talk about why the correlations matter. <clears throat> and uh, you can see that from this toy example where, uh, so in the last row, I have generated uh, three different con configurations of the joint distribution of gene one and gene two. So in the first case, these two genes are highly positively correlated. In the second case, they are independent. And in the last case, it's highly negatively correlated. So you can see uh, uh, these three patterns are very different if, if we can see from the joint uh, scatter plot. But this information uh, cannot be captured by the uh, marginal dis distributions because if you see the marginal distributions of gene one and gene two, they're actually uh, almost identical across these three scenarios. So correlation will affect the joint distribution of genes and in particular it will affect the shape of your data. So suppose you want to simulate clusters, different clusters of cells then you, we really want to get the uh, shape of the cluster correctly, which means that we don't want to miss uh, the correlations among genes. So that's very important. Okay, so then I will introduce our proposed ICD-9 tool. Uh, so first we have the input, which is a uh, the real data is a, is a count matrix. So these are these discrete values of counts. And uh, we will assume that the cells have been labeled uh, with the cell types uh, by the researcher who have conducted the experiment or uh, users can run a clustering algorithm to cluster the cells first. And then we will uh, extract the sum matrices from the real count matrix, and then we will fit a deep one uh, gene joint distribution for each of these sub matrices. That's the mod, uh, parameter estimation part. Uh, and then for the data simulation part, we'll use the estimated uh, parameters, the fitting model, and then combined with user specified sequencing depths and number of cells to uh, generate uh, simulated data. So here is an example where the sequencing depths become lower. And then uh, we can use this simulated data for uh, guidance for experimental design and evaluation of computational methods. Uh, so, so now I'll talk about a little bit of the details of our model fitting part. So again, we suppose that the cells in the real count matrix have been clustered into cell types, and then we will fit one model to each cell type. And then, uh, so for each model, uh, we will first fit a marginal distribution for each gene, and then we will fit the joint distribution of all genes. For the marginal distribution, uh, we take kind of a data-driven approach so we'll choose among the Poisson distribution, zero inflated Poisson negative binomial and zero, zero inflated negative binomial distributions. And, uh, and we will choose from these four available distributions by a likelihood ratio test. Uh, and then, so that's the marginal distributions. And then for the joint distribution of all genes, we will, uh, it will be, uh, Generated by a, it will, fit, it will be fitted by a Coplan model. 
Briefly speaking, we will transform each marginal distribution to a standard Gaussian distribution using the CDF and inverse CDF transform. And then we will fit a correlation matrix for these transformed Gaussian variables. Okay. And then for the data simulation, it's just pretty straightforward. You need to input the model parameters, one for each cell type, and then the cell type proportions. And then also total number of cells to simulate total number of reads in the simulated data. And then in the simulation, we will first determine the cell numbers for each cell type. Um, and then we will adjust, uh, we'll adjust the uh, input model parameters uh, by calculating a scaling factor by comparing the sort of the ratio between the uh, new sequencing depths and the old sequencing depths and use that to adjust uh, the mean parameters for our model. And then we'll just go ahead to simulate one uh, submatrix for each cell type and then combine the simulated submatrices together as one data matrix. Okay, so now I will show some results. Uh, so first we did a series of comparison to existing simulators. And uh, here is a series of violin plots that shows the uh, distribution of candles tau uh, among gene pairs for the test data, which is the first column, and then also these uh, other simulators. So this candles tau is a rank-based correlation, which is uh, better suited to uh, describe the correlation uh, for uh, count data count type of data. So we can see that, so our, the goal is that we want the simulators to have a, the avalin plots to have similar shape to the test data. And we can see that ICDN2 has the best performance among all uh, compared with existing simulators. And the best competitor with ICDN2 are uh, this sim wave and also uh, sparse sim. Uh, so, so, so then we decide that we will look at uh, this sim wave and sparse sim, these two simulators in more details. And also we did a sort of, this is like a, this without copula case is where we only simulate data with uh, marginal distributions. This is like a negative control. Okay, so next we look at the uh, correlation pattern of the highly expressed genes. Uh, so here we have the results for one of the cell types for the ten, for a 10x genomic data set. And we can see that uh, the correlation matrix uh, of the data by ICD-LAN2 is almost identical to the, the real data. And it looks better than uh, this other two simulators and also better than this negative control where we miss all the correlations. And here is another example. This is for a SmartSeq2 uh, data set. Uh, this, is, this is more obvious that we can almost capture all the correlations. The pattern is almost the same and uh, they all miss the correlation patterns. Okay, so, uh, so, so that's the previously that's the result for uh, one cell type. Uh, so next we look at the uh, performance of simulators uh, with multiple cell types. And uh, we can do the comparison based on uh, dimensionality reduction results. So here we uh, project uh, both the, this is the train data and test data, these are the real data and also the simulated data by TSNE to a two-dimensional space. And we can see that uh, the pattern generated by ICDN2 is the most uh, similar to the train data and test data compared to uh, these other three uh, methods. And also, uh, if we mix the simulated data with test data 
and then we project it to the TSNE space, we can see that uh, for SCDN2, it can only SCDN2 can mix the best uh, with the tested. Okay, so that's the com comparisons. How to measure similarity between 2D representations? Uh, yeah, so here uh, we don't have a, a matrix for, I mean, a metric for the uh, similarity. It is just like by, uh, by, by just looking at this class. Yeah. Okay, so, so now I'm going to talk about some of the applications of our method. Uh, so first, it's, this is a, actually a straightforward application. This is showing that in addition to the single cell RNC technology, we can also apply our method to other uh, single cell technologies. Uh, so here we have the dimensionality reduction results for uh, the MERFISH data and PCI seq data. And we can see that uh, for SCDN2, we can also preserve the, the 2D uh, structure, or sorry, the, the global structure of the MERFISH data and PCI seq data very well. Although this is not single cell RNA seq technology, this is uh, spatial uh, transcriptome te uh, technology, I think. So Tianyi, there is a question in the chat box. How do you measure similarity between 2D representations? Oh yeah, so I just I just mentioned that uh, we, we don't have a, I think in the paper we, we didn't have a metric for the uh, similarities. This is just by looking at the patterns themselves. Yeah, yeah because I think it's it's not reasonable to apply any metric to TSNE visualization since TSNE is a random projection. Every time you run TSNE, even with the same perplexity parameter, the if you don't set a seed, then the visualization may be different. So that's why I feel like it's more used as a visualization tool and not as a quantitative projection. Yes, I think in this patterns, I think it's pretty clear, especially for this uh, last four panels where we mix the test data with the simulated data. Uh, this is, yeah, it mixes best, I think. Yeah, I agree. I, I was curious because we work on that in our lab. So, so uh, thank you okay. for the, answering the question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so this is showing we can also do well for other uh, single cell technologies. And then here, uh, there is uh, another application. So I mentioned uh, that uh, in the when we fit the marginal distributions, we can we can, we actually use a light blue ratio test to determine whether we will use a zero inflated model or not. Uh, so then we decide that we can actually use the likelihood ratio test to benchmark uh, to actually to, or to compare the full length protocols with the um, tag based protocols. So here is an example of that. So here the pink and is the 10x genomics protocol, the green is the drop seek protocol. So these two are tag based protocols. And then the blue is the smart seek tool protocol, which is a full lens protocol. So here I've shown the cell library size. Uh, so for the full lens protocol, it has a larger cell library size distribution for uh, the, the cells. And uh, also uh, we have, we have, uh, we can only simulate uh, less cells for the uh, full lens protocols compared to the uh, type based protocols. But then uh, we can also look at the uh, proportion of selected models uh, for each protocols. And here I have marked the selected models of that, that is marked as zero inflation by, by black. And so, it, so you can see from this plot, it's pretty clear that uh, only for SmartSeq2, we have about half of the genes that, that will be selected as uh, have zero inflation, and the and you know the other half does not have zero inflation. And then for both of these uh, tag-based protocols, 
there's very little proportion of cells that will be determined that have, or sorry, genes that will be determined have uh, zero inflation. And uh, here I also, uh, we also we can also uh, visualize the result with some special uh, cases. Uh, here I've listed four genes. So these two will all, will all be detected as no zero inflation uh, across these three protocols. And these two genes are detected as no zero inflation for these two protocols, these two type-based protocols, and have zero inflation in the SmartSeq2 protocol. So this, this example shows that this zero inflation pattern is mainly due to a, a protocol uh, uh, reason. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and then we have the application where we want to, uh, we can use uh, our similar to benchmark uh, clustering methods and determine the optimal uh, configuration of experimental parameters. So here uh, we've selected six cell, cell types from a 10X data set. And then we consider two uh, ex experimental design scenarios. In the first scenario, we fix the total number of cells to sequence, and then we vary the total number of reads to change from small to large. And in the second case, we fix the total number of uh, total sequencing depths, and then we vary the cell numbers we change from small to large. So you can see in the first case, um, the curve, it shows the clustering accuracy. So in the first case, uh, as we increase the total number of UMIs or total sequencing depths, we get more information for each cell. So the clustering accuracy will first, first increase and then it will uh, saturate. Also for IC3, it's, it's the same trend. But in the second case, um, the accuracy, clustering accuracy will first increase and then decrease. So this is showing the, the, the breadth versus depth trade-off that I mentioned before in the toy example. And uh, we can use this curve to select optimal uh, uh, experimental design parameters. For example, for this first case, we can choose this, this number. Uh, and for the second case, we can choose a different uh, cell number that can give a better clustering result. And then we can also do a similar type of analysis for uh, the rare cell type detection. So here I have two uh, rare cell det detection methods and uh, we can also uh, draw the um, clustering accuracy, uh, so, sorry, the, the cell type det rare cell type det detection accuracy curve where we have the precision recall F1 score. And for, for the fire method, we also have the AUPRC. So also in the first scenario where we increase the total sequencing depth, the performance will become better. And in the second case, this there's uh, like a, a bowl-shaped curve. And uh, so this type of curves can help us to determine the uh, best experimental design parameters. Okay, so here uh, is a brief summary. Uh, so ICD-10 is a interpretable, sim interpretable simulator that can generate realistic single cell gene expression count data with gene correlations. This is motivated by our previous work, assay design. Uh, we, so we, here we have a multi-gene generative model. It's probabilistic, transparent, and interpretable. And uh, it can be used for guidance for SCRNC experimental design and used to benchmark computational methods. And we have uh, our package. Uh, this is the link there. And the future work will be uh, that we want to in, in extend the current model to accommodate conti continuous cell trajectories because currently we can only fit uh, one model for the different cell types, but we cannot do a uh, cell trajectory. So we want to do that uh, in the future. And finally, we want to, I want to uh, thank Dong Yuan and Vivian and my advisor, Jessica, for uh, their collaboration and advice. Okay. And uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>